All right. So the the topic of today's talk is uh, programming with distributed systems with Aquamarine. And I know this is not the title you were promised, but believe me, it's a very worthy uh, uh, bait and switch. So I hope you will not be disappointed. Before we go into Aquamarine and uh, and uh, the way to program distributed systems, especially peer to peer systems, let me uh, just uh, tell you a little bit about Fluence Labs. Fluence Labs builds open source peer to peer networks, uh, development tools, and components to really support developers to to master and be successful at programming peer to peer and distributed applications. While over the year, over the last few years, we've had a lot of advances at the lower level. Uh, the network level and uh, uh, lower primitive level uh, programming tooling like lib P2P. But if you've ever tried to put on top of uh, peer-to-peer protocols, you you know it's uh, it's still extremely frustrating and uh, very very challenging. And that's really where Fluence comes in with our with our uh, ecosystem almost to uh, to support developers to make it easier to accelerate the build out and. Uh, Really make it a, a much more enjoyable experience to uh, to build on peer to peer, and that's why we actually created Aquamarine. And Aquamarine is a runtime and programming language. Actually, it's two programming languages. We'll get to that. That really enables enables peer to peer coordination and composition for distributed applications and backends. Uh, before we actually, as we go on, one of the reasons why uh, we are focused on peer to peer is peer to peer. It's pretty much the only way to uh, avoid central to censorship, and uh, and that comes from centralized systems. And this is this is not just uh, uh, from a political perspective; it's increasingly from a business perspective. As you probably all have heard, multiple companies have been shut down by the likes of Amazon, Facebook, and uh, and others, and uh, that's a real threat to uh, to an enterprise and uh, to individual developers and app developers. And peer-to-peer -peer offers an alternative to it without too much penalties, and that's a, a huge, huge step forward in, as part of the entire Web3 movement. So, the need for distributed programming tools. There, as I said, so there, there is the centralization aspect of it, the decentralization aspect of it, but at the same time, there's also a a use case to be made that allows peer-to-peer -peer programs to run on much thinner, much lighter, much cheaper devices in hosting environments than your traditional client servers. And one of the reasons is that uh, if you look at the traditional uh, request-response pairing process by client-server applications, let's just say you 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 want to get a Stripe authorization and then you want to send an SMS to the user to inform them of the authorization process outcome. And uh, so usually what you do is you send your request to Stripe, you get a response, then you turn around and send the response to, I don't know, to IO, and uh, they send the SMS and you're all good to go. So in many respects, uh, uh, your, your client, your, your application handles an end-to-end -end request response calls. That's expensive, not just from a traffic perspective, but from the... Uh, from the resources required to host or, or, or run that application. Peer-to-peer -peer networks allow you to approach this a little bit differently and much more effectively. And basically what it allows you to do is it allows you to take the response from a service, let's just call it S-1, and then to immediately drive that response into the next service, service S. And so you, you don't get these uh, intermittent round trips. You just get one forward chain uh, 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 data package delivery that uh, hops from service to service to service. However, this doesn't, this, this, while this is possible with distributed and peer to peer networks, this isn't an inherent capability. You actually have to work to get this. And this, is where uh, Acmarine comes in and really shines. So what is Acmarine? Acmarine is actually, it's an umbrella. Acmarine is, is comprised of uh, multiple tools, and one of them is a virtual machine. It's uh, developed in Rust, and it's a, it's a WebAssembly module. Uh, it is comprised of a low-level language, AIR, Acmarine Intermediate Representation, which we will be looking at today. And 
that low level language is actually intended to be a compilation target, but that's the first one we had. And our aqua, our high level language, which is super ergonomic, you'll, you'll really love it. But uh, as I'm advertising it, it's not quite ready. It just wasn't ready today. It's going to be another week or so. And uh, so we'll be looking at air throughout this presentation. And what Acmarine, what that ecosystem allows you to do is it really enables you to separate the orchestration from the service business logic. And that's a huge, huge step towards uh, uh, getting the, these efficiencies possible through peer-to-peer -peer networks. It obviously allows you to do peer-to-peer -peer applications. And another aspect that's inherent, it's a first-class citizen in within the Fluence Aquamarine vision is that it allows you to build zero trust applications right out of the box. For those of you, just I'm, I'm just going to go very quickly. Zero trust applications or zero trust is basically trust nobody. It's it's an approach. It's a security approach to networks that's really gathering and uh, and uh, uh, getting momentum. And you trust nobody, nothing. Everything needs to be authenticated. Everything needs to be authorized. There is no inherent trust in anything. And uh, that's a really, really an increasingly popular and uh, necessary framework as we start breaking down uh, walls of our infrastructures and get more and more interconnected and collaborative. And uh, this is uh, uh, inherent in the Acmarine design. And we'll get to that with an example. And... Uh, so at the bottom, uh, it basically just shows you how it all fits together. Now, in order to get all this done, you need a solid foundation. If you develop an, an, a system like Acmarine, you you got to have a solid foundation. And our solid foundation is inspired by PyCalculus. Uh, PyCalculus is, if you want to take anything away from this, it, it basically gives you the mathematical tools to describe and model concurrent systems with dynamic typo, typo, topologies. And this is crucial. Everything else is wonderful, and it allows us to model and verify and, uh, and then actually build a system and instructions and operators. But it's the, that, that being able to model dynamic topologies is, is huge. And the reason for that is the following. In peer-to-peer -peer networks, and many distributed networks, peers come and go. It's expected behavior, not exception behavior. And that makes it very, very tricky and difficult to model. Because, uh, as I said, like uh, a route you were able to execute uh, one second ago may just not be available to you anymore. So this, is, so this gives you... Uh, uh, a formal framework to deal with uh, those kind of shifting and evolving networks. So how do you, actually, let me just go back. So PyCalculus comes with a few operators, and if you uh, ever been exposed to, say, uh, a Lambda Calculus, for example, you know that uh, a handful of operators in those formal uh, languages and algebras are extremely powerful and basically let you do just about anything you need to do. So how do you go from the theory then to the implementation? Well, we have a, a few instructions as well, derived from the PyCalculus, and uh, we basically have an execution command. We have a sequential parallel processing. We have a fold operation and branching and an identity. So that's not much, but it actually, it's extremely powerful and uh, lets you get a lot of work done very, very quickly. So, what does it look like in Air? Air, recall, is the uh, is the low level language we're looking at. So you look at an instruction set that's basically comprised of an instruction, like the call, the execution, and then data pertinent to the service and the node. So basically, what this statement here says, it basically it says, call the function put for service DHT at node peer ID. Give it the value, give it the two values, key and value, and uh, I expect a named output called result. And that's it. And uh, we'll we'll go through all this a little bit more in detail, obviously. And uh, but that's uh, that's extremely powerful notion. So uh, uh, your location, your peer ID obviously uh, needs is, is dynamic. Your service ID may be dynamic, and your function is actually fixed in the sense that it, it corresponds to the public API of the service referenced. 
and the uh, key values actually are being piped into the uh, instruction set. So then you get your result. That's it. And uh, that actually allows you to do a lot in terms of peer-to-peer -peer programming. However, we need one more construct. In order for in order to go from one peer service to another peer service without ever going back to your client, you need you need you need something that knows what's going on. And uh, this is what we call a particle. So particle is a data structure that combines data, the execution sequence, and some metadata. And how this is implemented, we see on the right. So basically, we have this air script, just like I showed you before. And we didn't put much in there except for uh, basically traversing nodes. And basically what it says is go from Firefox, your peer client, that initiates the uh, application or the, the, the choreography of the services from node A to node B to node C. Eventually we end up at another browser called Chrome. And so these particles travel from service to service. And as it's programmatically specified in the AIR implementation, and basically results along the way. And the Aquamarine virtual machine does a really good job at uh, every peer to, be, to make sure the particles travel where they need to travel. So what does that look like uh, from a different perspective? Here, so think of this application, for example, as a chat application, peer-to-peer -peer chat application, right? And we got this uh, big circle, which is our network, which in this case, a Kademlia network. Uh, the white squares are the nodes, and the little red dots are the services on a node. And you can have uh, more than one service, obviously, per node. And then depending on your service requirements, you build, you write your air script, like, for example, on the right again, which is the same as from the previous slide. And uh, now this particle starts traversing the network according to the programmatic specification you, the developer, has given it to do. And in this case, so we're going from the browser to, to some services, and then we end up at, uh, at the Chrome. So for example, I'm sending a message, so we got a message service somewhere, and we want to add emoji, so we got an emoji service somewhere with a file upload right there, and then it goes to the uh, Chrome browser, and now we have uh, uh, hello with a smiley face emoji ending up at the Chrome browser. And this is this is obviously really, really powerful. And this uh, illustrates how the separation of the workflow, if you will, and uh, the service is extremely powerful and uh, really brings out all the advantages and capabilities of uh, distributed and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Let me go, let me stay on the slide for a second. As I said in, uh, in the response request, by separating the workflow, you take a, a huge load off your front-end application in terms of uh, resources required to host it and to run it. And that actually uh, changes or could change where an application is, is hosted. So lighter requirements allow us to host applications, particularly with WebAssembly in browsers on uh, on very light mobile devices and on IoT devices. And uh, particularly on the industrial side, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking and uh, uh, IoT, I think, has a huge, huge uh, future. It's already taking place. And with peer-to-peer, -peer, obviously, you're somewhat transport agnostic, especially with lib P2P, and you can very easily switch to uh, Wi-Fi Direct or a variety of mesh networks, which are extremely pertinent to IoT. So, as is, so again, this is an extremely powerful way to lighten the requirements for your client and take advantage of the capabilities at the node level, which uh, we believe is a huge, huge, huge advantage over traditional programming uh, approaches and network approaches. So, where does this get us? So. For the purpose of this uh, uh, presentation, so I, I, I ended up coding up a couple of little services, and uh, let's just go through them. One is called an echo service, and let's just say it's deployed on peer A. And basically, we're building a in Rust, we're building a, a 
a small application that then will compile target on uh, WASI. And there is a markup that's fluent specific in order to get the uh, Rust to WASI uh, uh, and Aquamarine capabilities in place. But fundamentally, what we're doing here is we're taking an input, which is a, an array of strings, and returning an array of echo structs, which the only member is a string. And obviously, that doesn't really mean much, but uh, I needed an entry into a service. And the entry, rather than building an SQL or MySQLite or whatever uh, uh, service, this is just very quick. And it's a proxy to stand in for any kind of database or other uh, storage-based service you could possibly imagine. And then we have a greeting service. The greeting service basically just takes a name, which is a string. And now... and Let's just say the greeting services are deployed on, on different peers, multiple peers. So how do we actually go from the echo service to the greeting service? And we do this with Acmarine. So the services are the same, so I just really made them very small. And so now we build an Aquamarine, an, an air script. And basically, so don't don't be afraid of the parentheses. It's uh, once Aqua comes along, you don't have to deal with it. So uh, so one more week maybe. But uh, basically, what we're doing is uh, we're entering, we we're calling a public node, the relay node, and uh, we're we're calling the echo service. And in this particular case, we our arguments, our values are names, which are piped in. And in our case, if you look to the right, are Bob, Bill, and Jack. So what can we do now? So we now specify a workflow that uh, calls um, that calls the greeting services by uh, decomposing the result. The named output, echo result, is now the input directly into subsequent services. In order to get a semi-decent size of the uh, uh, diagram of the uh, code on the screen, I only use two greeting services. And what we're doing is we're basically we're decomposing the echo result manually in this case into into uh, two arguments for two different services: one on node two, one on node three. One is greeting service one, one is greeting service two. And then at the end, and in, in, in each call, we now have a named output, and uh, there are two. Separate ones, a greeter result from the first service and a greeter result from the second service. And then at the end, we now call and check on our results. And this is what we get. We only use two service, and we had Bob, Bill, and Jack going in, and we have Bob and Bill coming out because we only use two. And if you look at uh, the uh, decomposition, echo result uh, zero, echo result one is Bob and Bill, and that's what we got back. So this is how we took advantage in a kind of a lame way with uh, sequential processing and uh, knowing the inputs to quickly get to the workflow into the consuming service and uh, values. However, we can do better. And how we do better is we use fold, we use an iterator. And what we've done here now is we have, uh, we call again the same service, the echo service, and we pipe in Bob, Bill, and Jack. And now we fold right here. And uh, we basically decompose and, and call our our iterator value variable item. And then we just go to one node, greeting service one, and we pipe in the item iteratively and we get a array of results now which as you see is hi bob bill and jack so that's pretty cool didn't have to do anything and again uh the particle traveled from the echo service to the greeting service and uh, uh iterated over the requirements are there any questions at this point well, it's deployed from a from an application, so uh, so I'll show it to you in a minute. But once it, it it's it's released in the wild, if you will, it travels according to the path you give it. You programmatically specify it. So the logic to route, the the, the resolution logic is on each of the nodes. So a VM, an Aquamarine VM, is on every node. Is that your question, Madam? 
got it. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay. So I wanted to show you one more example, and actually more than that, but uh, an alternative way is you can run services in parallel. Now, this doesn't make much sense for what I've done. I, I, I forgot. I It just occurred to me very late last night, and I didn't get around to uh, code up another service, so I'm just talking you through it. So basically what we're doing here is we're taking the item and piping it into two services in parallel. So again, for the inputs, Bob, Bill, and Jack, you now get back two arrays, Bob, Bill, and Jack. That doesn't really make much sense, right? But but if the greeting service, if I had been uh, enough foresight, I would have uh, not just had the function take a, a name string, but also a Boolean value that it uh, determines whether or not I say hi or bye. And now we could have piped into the second greeting an additional variable, or in both cases, one true, one false, and we would have ended up with hi, Bob, Bill, Jack, and bye, Bob, Bill, Jack. So, and if you look at the length of the, the program, if the air, it's, it's, it's super, super efficient. And uh, you can actually, you can accomplish a lot with uh, relatively little code. In uh, in the in this peer to peer environment, in part because uh, the Aquamarine components, especially the VM, take care of of all the heavy lifting, and that is really the whole point to to make it easier to to make it accessible, and uh, for you to as a developer to have fun doing it and uh, actually uh, get results you want. So. I'm missing a slide now. Big surprise, hang on. Uh, okay. So I wanted to show you one more thing. I talked about uh, uh, zero trust and inherent security. And uh, in ACMARINE, services are exposed actions in form of functions, and they may require authorization. And uh, the easiest concept is what's generally referred to ambient authorization, where authentication gives you authorization. It's uh, basically, it's in Linux, our most operating system. That's how it gets, right? You get your user, user authentication, and that gives you an ambient authorization realm to work within. And that's pretty much what you get out of the, out of, out of the box with Acmarine, even though you can um, you can extend this very very significantly, and uh, the the core concept in Acmarine is that of a tetraplet, which is basically the peer ID, the service ID, the function name, and the data getter, and uh, that allows you to enable secure composition of functions within Air. So now let me switch. Okay. So what we so I got a, a Docker container running that's the actual node here locally. So just so you can get a look, let me close this. We pulled the Docker container for, for the uh, node and um, it starts you up and it gives you a whole bunch of things right up front. It, it tells you what the air interpreter is which is the uh, Aquamarine virtual machine. It gives you uh, the certificates for the key pairs, and it gives you the unique server peer ID, which is really important because that's, as you saw in the uh, air scripts, this is what we need to call or ref refer to when we uh, specify peer peers and peer location. And then you get your, your traditional connect connectivity and uh, your basic... Uh, your basic uh, lib P2P like uh, logging with a lot of uh, fluence and Aquamarine in particulars. Okay, so we got that. And let me see, there should be another one. And I prepared another service. This is probably too small, so let me make this here. So the greeting service we saw before, I re-implemented that, 
But now I'm putting in a, a check whether or not the caller is actually the owner of the service. So anybody who's ever done any uh, Solidity programming, for example, you know this, like Origin, because it's owner. And uh, the way we've done that is we, we inherently take uh, advantage of the security tetraplectic that's built in that comes with uh, Acmarine, and we do the is owner check. And from the inherent call parameters, that's where we really start to ref referring to the security tetraplet, we, we check whether or not the uh, caller is the initiating peer ID and whether the owner is the service creator peer ID. And then we just do the Boolean check, and that gives us whether or not somebody is the owner of the service. As I said, this is ambient uh, authorization. There is much more we can do, but uh, I think for today, this is pretty much uh, all we need to do. So now going back to the greeter. So if uh, if um, if you're not the owner, you get an error. And uh, if you are the owner, you get your high whatever. And instead of just a string, I created a small struct. I call it greeting result or result. And uh, it has two members, public obviously, uh, one's the greeting and uh, the error string. So you have to put a little bit of effort in resolving whether or not this is a good call or a bad call, but it's not particularly difficult. If error string is empty, as you can see, then uh, obviously it goes the result. And that's it. So let's have a look. So all right, this is probably also way too small. I'm using a tool called FLDist, which is a, a, a tool, a fluence tool, command line tool to interact with the node and to build, to deploy services, to do all the, the kind of heavy lifting. You can also use a JavaScript uh, SDK to, to build uh, actual applications rather than just command line, but for our purposes, the command line should just do. So what are we doing? This is the this is the uh, CLI application. Now we're giving it. Now we're feeding it the node ID, which I just showed you. Hang on, was right here, and uh, the node address, which is basically the ID plus the local address. We want to run an air script, and uh, the air script is called greet CL. Jake for closure, and let me just, I forgot to show you that. Uh, here scripts. This is the script we're calling. So basically what we're doing, so the X or the branching is basically, it's an error catch, right? Uh, I think you've seen that. If, uh, if the uh, first branch doesn't execute properly, you get the second branch, and that gives you the actual error message or the last error through the execution, execution loop. And so what we're doing, basically, you don't see any difference than what you've seen before. We, we call the greeter with the greeting, the greeting service with the greeting function. We give it the name on the node, which we fill in, and uh, then we get back our result. And that was the part I had shown in the presentation for the, in the slides for the other uh, uh, examples. So we had the node. We give it the node address. We give it the command, which is run the air script. We give it the location of the air script, and I just showed you what it looks like. And now we come the data. Here comes the data. We're piping in the data. And in the air script, you saw the reference to the node, which was the node ID, and we pipe it in like this. And then we need the greeter, which is this greeting service, if you recall which is this. And this I got from when I created the service. So when you create a service, you actually have to take some notes, uh, manually or otherwise, and uh, you have to take a hold of your greeting service. Although the service ID you can retrieve differently from our dashboard, for example. And I'll show you the dashboard in a minute. And then the name we pipe in was just Booyah. And now we run it. Oh. Look at that. I am not the owner. I got barred and there is no greeting for us. And the reason for that is that we didn't provide the authorization credentials necessary. And here is, so here now we get the additional flag, which is uh, 
called the client seed or the seed, and you get the expre- you get the token. And that I also got when I created the service, or I could have specified it as I was creating the service. And this is obviously super secret. You should not share this with anybody, particularly if you're using it to uh, guard your service with the authorization. And uh, now let's see if we add that to our 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 uh, data. Uh, what happens? All right, all right. I didn't screw up. Okay, I did it late. Uh, uh, and uh, now we are authorized, and we get the expected greeting. Uh, any questions to, about this right now? No. All right. So going back, so you know, going through logs, that's not particularly exciting, but uh, here you see how those particles executed, at least at the log level. All right, now back to the presentation. So you so you saw that uh, basically just like you do in uh, Solidity or any other or you know in Substrate uh, where where you check the origin with uh, against some uh, signed message or or private key or secret key you basically very quickly and very easily get to a very robust uh, authorization capability and as i said this is built into uh, acmarine through what's called a secure what we call a security tetraplet so it's in the out of the box and all you have to do is write this one little function and my owner or whatever you want to call it and uh and just start uh, uh guarding your functions as on a per function level as necessary and uh that's uh really really powerful so and it gets uh and also necessary so imagine you have you don't you are uh, running a, a database, for example. You obviously want this to be uh, guarded because otherwise everybody is going to start uh, overwriting your data. And because one thing, I don't know if I if I mentioned this. I mean, one of the the whole uh, the big ideas really is that all this is happening in permissionless peer to peer networks, right? This is this isn't private. This is this is these are permissionless peer to peer networks where peers can join, they can choose uh, what kind of services they want to host. So it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a really really uh, a powerful yet simple way of bringing security into access security into a uh, permissionless peer-to-peer or otherwise distributed network. And uh, as you can tell, I'm obviously extremely enamored with the notion and the capability because I think it's, uh, it's, it's super, super cool. And it solves a huge, huge problem in that space at no expense of the developer. Okay, so for a quick recap, so services... In, in, in this distributed peer-to-peer network environments are basically our business logics. And they're totally uh, 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 built on WASM modules, which share nothing. So they're independent, and you compose services from multiple modules. And then Aquamarine, through Air, and next week or so, Aqua, can call the services exposed API and provide the authentication credentials as necessary to uh, protected methods so since it's, i mean obviously you can't protect exposed methods from going private right so you, you have to use this authentication mechanism and uh, that allows you to choreograph services into applications independently from the services business logic concerns and uh, i sort of showed you that with uh, that one example the contrived example where we paralyzed Parallel inputted the uh, arrays into two different services and uh, or, or different use cases of one service, and this was all without ever touching the service. And uh, that's that's one of the huge powers of uh, peer-to-peer. And Acmarine really allows you to uh, to access that power uh, very very easily, in my opinion. There's a little bit of a learning curve, obviously, but it's I don't think it's particularly hard. 
So from my end, that's pretty much it. But uh, obviously, I'm more than happy to discuss. And uh, let me go back. Uh, how are we with questions? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, if you look at, uh, so I'm going to uh, Shubham. Is there a way to trace? Yes, yes, yes. There is a way to trace. And um, so first of all, you got the logs, right? But then the other way was you can also, quote, unquote, get print statements, if you will. So when you see the results being returned, let me go back to this. So here, for example, we, we, we called it, we executed it, we get back what the client seed was, we get the client peer ID, which is my client, we get the relay peer ID, which was the node I'm running, right? Uh, here, let's just uh, Docker. Yeah, we had the PRD here. And then we had the statement in the execution, in, in, in not the execution, in the air script to actually return your result here. That's not really necessary. This is this is only for us to verify what we've done. If you hang on, we had uh, air scripts full parallel. So in the sequential one, which was I think the first or second example, this is the air script, and uh, I've been calling the return service up here. So we, we called the echo service, we piped in the data, and then I, I called for the results, which wasn't necessary. And this is how you can start tracing where things happen and where things go wrong. Now, in addition, in addition, uh, if I, uh, we can have this built in to make it uh, very explicit of what's going on. So I added to the to the uh, execution command. I added the uh, a, a debug log, and that shows you everything you need to you ever wanted to know and didn't want to know about uh, what was going on in your in your in your particle execution. So it gives you it gives you the part of the scripts where it's going on, what's been executed where. The various traces, the uh, 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 processing outcome, the next peer, and on and on it goes. So uh, this was a very long answer to uh, uh, the question. So uh, yes, it uh, you can trace the routing path, and this is how you can start debugging. Unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't keep any of my uh, bad scripts, so I can't. I don't have any error ones right now to show you, but uh, it's definitely there. Okay, uh, elaborate on fault tolerance. So, Shuban, did, did that answer your question? Okay, great. Uh, elaborate on fault tolerance, error handling with scripts with XOR operation. Okay. All right, so let's go back to Okay, so by utilizing, I mean branching is is good for a lot of things, but uh, one of one of the the really powerful applications of branching or in our DX or is to branch between 
what we consider a good path and uh, the failure. So anywhere along the path, actually, anywhere along the path, so and this is just one module, if it fails, the branching gets triggered and you get the return service for the last error. And, and so that does two things. First of all, it, it, it doesn't just crash. You don't get a panic, right? You, you basically you get a clean, clean exit from your program. And uh, second of all, it, it literally gives you, I mean, it's the last error. It gives you the last error that caused it, which, quote unquote, from your perspective, is the first error, right? Because it's, uh, it, it is where it failed. And uh, that gives you a, a certain degree of uh, fault tolerance in the sense that, uh, A, you don't end up with a panic, and B, you execute up to that point for the error. And uh, that's uh, that's actually a pretty neat feature, uh, not just from, from a debugging perspective, but also from an implementation perspective, because uh, in many respects, you don't have to uh, catch your, 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 you know, try, accept, try, accept, try, accept all along. You just basically branch it like you almost do sort of in Rust, where it bubbles up as, uh, as a result. And... Uh, and that's actually a, a pretty neat feature because if uh, uh, I shouldn't probably say this, but if we uh, if Aqua was built or Air was built on the Go model, you're uh, you, you had to try and try and accept uh, at every step of the way your programs would be uh, not particularly ergonomic, and uh, you'd end up with a, uh, a huge, huge, huge uh, number of parentheses, which uh, you already don't want to end up with. Anything, uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Alexei. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions, discussions? I mean, it was, it was a fairly high level. I mean, it's, 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 it's a comp Aquarine solves a complex problem. So you can't just like okay here it is and uh, and uh, nicely uh, gift wrapped. However, we're getting there. We're 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 getting there, and uh, maybe it's not necessary for developers to actually understand all the the challenges and the problems in order to be able to successful uh, developers in in that uh, peer to peer medium. However. Knowing at least some of it and uh, why we're doing what we're doing is, in my opinion, at, at this stage, just as important as uh, as it is to uh, to know how to use it. And as I said on the outset, most of our our code is Rust based, and I think uh, and Alexi can chime in any time. We are super super happy with uh, with Rust. It brings a lot of capabilities. It brings uh, uh, ergonomics, which I think you even see in in air uh, a way of thinking. And uh, the VM, if you look at uh, the code, so it's uh, I think it's the same GitHub. It's uh, GitHub.com fluence. Hang on, GitHub.com fluence labs slash fluence or slash aquamarine you'll see it's uh, it's a super tight implementation of the interpreter and uh, the capabilities rust brings with to uh, to compile into uh, rosin targets is just awesome and uh, anyway so we're, we're I think we're super happy with it and uh, I think uh, it would have been much harder to build the Aquamarine system in, say, C, C++, or anything else. I don't even know if anything else would have been possible than uh, Rust. So, and as when I think over time we're gonna go, we're gonna open up our WebAssembly uh, languages. But right now it's all Rust. So if you want to build services, oh yeah. So one thing that's really important is sort of there is an inherent division of labor in these peer-to-peer -peer application and networks. And the division of labor may not be clear, but it's certainly there. And one of the really 
empowering aspects is that you have nodes that can be operated by hosters or node operators. You have services like uh, the greeting service and the echo service I, I have on there, except for the one I secured. It's it's on there. It's on a dashboard. You can just uh, you can just grab it. You can access it, and you can use it, and you can compose it right today. And uh, let me just uh, show you the dashboard real quick. I, there's a lot of services that might take uh, a minute to load. So so there the, the, so the separation of concerns is around node around services, and uh, of course. Uh, your applications and the application literally is uh, I don't want to use the word gluing together but uh, but programmatically composing or coordinating or choreographing uh, services deployed services into your application and uh, and that's I mean that is uh, not just extremely powerful from an execution perspective but from a reuse perspective right so if we look so there is uh, here here is the echo service I put up it's on the network so this is our test network. So if you want to use it, you, you can. It's right there. And uh, to me, this is, is an extremely, extremely powerful uh, uh, man. It's uh, extra slow loading today. Of course it is. Uh, extra slow, uh, extra powerful, sorry, extra powerful uh, approach to, to developing applications. And I want to go back to the presentation one time since uh, you are uh, a little bit on the quiet side. I actually, uh, I actually developed a little uh, uh, fact section myself. So, how do I access services such as? Uh, generic web two endpoints not hosted on the peer-to-peer -peer network so this is a really good question to myself uh basically what you need to do you gotta you gotta build proxy services also known as adapters that are hosted on the peer-to-peer -peer network and uh we have a whole bunch if you look at the example uh a repo there's a whole bunch of uh of examples on how to do that but we're in the process of uh kickstarting sort of an adapted development sprint in the not so distant future and uh, uh, open source developers certainly have an opportunity to participate, and I think we actually could put some Gitcoin uh, efforts toward it. And uh, so that's that. Another question. Oh, great. Uh, do I have to run a peer-to-peer -peer network to benefit from Acrorain? You do not. You can, but you do not. And uh, now we also need to, to consider what's a network. Uh, a network is obviously an uh, amalgamation of peers. So for you to run a network, it would be multiple peers, and uh, it probably would be uh, uh, permissioned as opposed to permissionless. Uh, you, you can do this, obviously. But uh, Acmarine is really, really empowering you to participate in per safely participate in permissionless peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer networks where you get the power and the fault tolerance of, uh, of other peers out there contributing. And uh, so, no, you don't have to run one, but uh, you may want to run your own node, but you don't have to run a network at all. Uh, as it stands right now, we're even providing a test net for development purposes, and uh, so you don't even have to run a node. You can just uh, deploy your services or use services that are hosted on a very accessible test network. And uh, we're, we are thinking of, uh, depending on the uptake of, uh, of uh, a production hosting, of a production network that uh, we, we basically provide and uh, developers can either join with their nodes or just utilize. Another, that was another great question. And uh, oh yeah, and uh, I said somewhere along in the talk, I said monetization. We want to empower developers to monetize uh, their, their work. And one of the things we're doing, we're in the process of developing uh, a blockchain-based licensing system for uh, open source software, peer-to-peer -peer software, and trying to shift the value capture from uh, the big cloud operators who currently basically capture all the value, pretty much, particularly on open source contributions to open source developers. So what you can do then, or what you can't, what you will be able to do in uh, the not-so-distant future is uh, you develop a service 
And uh, in addition to the software license, you attach to it a service license. And that service license is uh, is immutably backed up on or immutably. Uh, uh, it's it's it's. <laughs> It's contractually and immutably deployed on a blockchain. I think it's going to be Ethereum-like-ish, and uh, and uh, that allows you not only to control the use of your service if you care, but you actually can start uh, implementing monetization patterns and uh, start making money. And one of the things where we believe peer-to-peer -peer is because the reusability of services, actually even small services that are crucial to a lot of other services, actually sort of in a pyramid development actually start can monetize much better than in any other environment, if that is something you are interested in. So now I'm... Um, okay, so all right, so this, okay. Yes and no. Uh, so, so the question, Shubham, is, uh, is I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, how do we maintain latency SLAs? SLAs is, is interesting. And uh, I think within the peer-to-peer -peer environment, fundamentally, you have to rethink your SLAs a little bit. Part of it is just that, um, as I said, in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, uh, you expect peers to drop, to shift, to move, to evolve, uh, rather than uh, treating it as, as an exception. And uh, that impacts how SLAs are offered. Now, at the service provider, you can provide SLAs at, at just as you want with any cloud, uh, big time cloud provider you get today. You, you can do it. And, uh, and uh, just like uh, with, uh, say, Amazon SLAs, for example, it's the failure and uh, the, the, it's the failure at the execution time that uh, starts adding to your minutes of unavailability and uh, uh, your failure of executing your SLA. But that's not, an, so just to make clear, this is not necessarily a network issue. It's a service provider issue. So if you, Shubham, want to uh, give five nines on your service, then you are totally happy or, or eligible to do so if i was you and i was doing this i would very very uh uh much probably run my own nodes right i mean you should be able to monetize if you're giving five nines you should be able to monetize and uh if you're if you monetize if you're able to monetize then you probably want to run your own nodes in order to um, eliminate any failure or at least control your your failure possibilities and probabilities. Did that answer your question? So, okay. I wouldn't necessarily call it a private network. One of the things, and Alexei actually asked me to uh, <laughs> to put it in the presentation, and I didn't want to because I thought uh, 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 it might confuse things a little bit. One of the things you're, you're doing when you're building your script, you're basically building a sort of a temporal virtual private network, right? Because... The, the realm, your, your topology of the execution path is really limited to what you're specifying programmatically within the air script. So you don't need to run a private network. You can run, you can host other people's services as well, right? I mean, it's not, it's not an isomorphic relation, not a one-to-one -one relationship between a service and a network, a network, a uh, node, a node can run as many services as it has capacity for. So you can still operate in a, permissionless public network, but provide performance guarantees around your specific nodes. It's, it's almost like the inverse of, uh, of staking nodes, right? Well, it's not the inverse, but uh, it's, it's like staking nodes. I mean, you run your own staking nodes in, uh, in a blockchain environment, and uh, you're still part of the, the, the public system. But it's your nodes, you guarantee their availability. And uh, uh, unlike... Uh, and, and, and the SLA equivalent is basically if your staking nodes don't 
perform or run when it's supposed to run, you get slashed. And basically, in you can look at it the same way. You run your nodes in a, in a public network, and uh, your services, just by the way the SLA is structured, and developers seek out those services, you basically create a, a virtual private network within a permissionless public network. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So yeah, I um, obviously, as you can see, like I'm, I'm, I'm very like I'm not a big fan of uh, of private in the sense that you have to run your network because this this is almost like uh, 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 defeating the purpose of having peer to peer, right? Because if you run your private, you're centralized. If you're centralized, you probably could just run it on a cloud on a basic cloud setup. But the whole point is that uh, the accessibility of uh, in a permissionless network, the discovery and the use of your services is just so much more than anywhere else. And uh, you get this organic marketplace for discovery of services and the reuse for them uh any anybody else all right i that's all i got uh folks very thank you very very much for yeah. for having me and uh thank you for being here i apologize for the the snafu with the slides i'll uh i'll uh, make them available as a pdf i'll send them Send him out, and uh, you all have a great, uh, great evening, great weekend. Stay safe, and thank you very much. Thanks, Bernard. Thanks, Anna and Alexi. Thanks for asking the question. Interesting presentation, and for thank you for everyone else attending. And I guess have a good day and a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody.